interesting being general manager of Sydney Theatre Company now because I actually worked here uh, 18 or so years ago when I first came out of university. Um, and the general manager and artistic director at that time um, were Michael Lynch was the general manager and Wayne Harrison was the artistic director. Um, and they were, they're a really interesting pair. Michael Lynch, of course, has gone on to have an incredible international career um, here in the South Bank Centre in London and is currently running the West Kowloon Cultural Precinct Development in Hong Kong, which is one of the biggest building projects, but also one of the biggest cultural projects in the world, um, probably ever. Um, and I think his ability to, he's such a great diplomat, he has a fantastic ability to pump energy out into a team uh, and into the whole organisation. So I found that a really striking quality and I've kept touch with him um, across the years. So that's always something that, you know, if I'm feeling a bit office bound or a bit grumpy, I try and, I try and remember that kind of energy. Um, and, you know, Wayne Harrison was, a, was an incredible artistic director. He had such a, um, uh, you know, he really looked after the kind of mainstay work, but around the edges, he was doing incredibly innovative stuff. So on the one level, he was doing a lot of work um, you know, in Western Sydney and community projects, um, he was investing in the development of new artists and plays. But he also, um, as director of Sydney Theatre Company, made an investment in tap dogs, which turned out to be this commercial phenomenon that, with, you know, at one point there were four tap dogs companies touring the world. So I think I think he was quite ahead of his time in thinking, you know, as a state theatre company, there is more that you can do, either to make revenue or more that you can do to contribute to to the community. So it was I was really lucky to work here at that at that time, and now that I'm in the job. Um, kind of reflect back on, on uh, you know, the impact they made on me when I was younger. I'm quite interested to see where the audience goes. Um, people periodically say things like, the audience is old and they're dying, what are we going to do? Uh, there is a fantastic arts marketer in Australia called Judith James who has been working in the field for decades and she once said to me, oh, don't worry about that, they were saying that in 1968. Um, but I'm kind of more interested in, uh, in, in cultural diversity as well. I don't think age is a problem. I, th I think that a lot of people who carry on about um, the audience is too old, I think it's almost a weird form of self-loathing. I think people want to go into their foyers and see hip young people in great clothes. And you know, I think it's part of that kind of fixation on youth. I actually think we've demonstrated over successive decades in the arts that younger people grow up to be older people. And you know, if they've had a positive experience or if they're in any way creatively inclined or aware, you, you know, you've got to find a way of getting them once that they have a predisposition in their life stage to come to the arts. That's my view. The other thing that people constantly are, are kind of getting panicked about is subscri subscriptions are dying. People are time poor, they don't want to subscribe anymore. And, and here and in the States, mainly uh, in the UK to an extent, the subscription model has been the key part of our business model since about you know, 1970. Um, so that is a cause for concern. Now, they have that, the panic of subscribers leaving us comes in waves, and each time there's a wave, companies get better at marketing or packaging subscriptions, and numbers often go up again. So we're not at the stage yet <clears throat> where a collapse of the subscriber business model is imminent. But you know, you do have to wonder. You know, if it's been around since the 1970s, there are always seismic changes in industries and um, a business model that, because we're working in the industry now and we're of this generation, we think it's like a perennial. You know, it's always been in the industry, but um, a lot of those, a lot of business models really only have one or two generations currency. So I'm, I'm really interested in. You know, if I wasn't running a, a business that was all about you know now and next year and the year after, I'd be really interested to spend more time kind of doing speculative work about how the business of the arts might need to adapt. Well, my uh, training at university was actually, uh, I was a writing major at UTS, I did the communications degree there. And uh, so I've been a freelance writer at different times, either as a second job or sometimes as my main way of making a living. Um, and so I did find myself for about three years being the music editor of Cosmopolitan magazine in Australia, which uh, seems quite weird in hindsight, but made some kind of sense at the time. Depends on the mood I'm in. Um, at the moment, I've been, uh, I've just come back from a trip overseas. I'm part of a um, group of um, international arts leaders who, who've been meeting once a year over a period of three years, and we're two meetings into the, into the series. And I think one of the things that really, uh, at the moment, just coming back from that, I'm a bit fired up about, is the whole idea that the arts are really hopeless lobbyists. Um, I sat next to a 
a, a former arts minister's advisor once, and he said, you know, the arts industry would get a lot further with government if you could get your act together in terms of lobbying. And I said, well, you know, there are several lobby groups. There's the National Association of Visual Arts, there's the Australian Major Performing Arts Group. And he stopped me and said, that's the problem. There, there are just too many. Like the whole message of art and culture is not cutting through because there are too many voices clamouring, you know, to, to decision makers. And then this guy from a small community organisation said, you're a dinosaur, you're irrelevant, what we do is relevant and, you know, we should be getting more support. And when you compare it, the symphony orchestra is still playing to tens of thousands of people and this community organisation was doing, you know, stuff in a warehouse for a hundred people at a time. Both valid work, but it was just this whole thing where you couldn't even have the dialogue about common, you know, values of cultural activity and cultural production because the sector itself is so invested in difference. Um, now look, I don't know if that's such a bad thing, maybe that's something we just have to have to get over, but you know, it'd be nice to think that somewhere there was there was some way, um, you know, particularly in some fora like talking to government, that we could actually get our act together and sort of have a consolidated message.